Thank you very, very much, everyone. It uh, has been three wonderful days, and I'm at the ending. This should be this should this is a this is a paper about irony, essentially, and laughter. So uh, one one of my aims is also making you laugh, which is the end of the three days. You should be very welcome. We are in a very formal place. We're at the, in a one of the course of white serious academia. It's a place with a powerful atmosphere. And I'm going to talk about something which is Asian and not very serious, apparently. So uh, that's already a contradiction, which is the basic structure, as we'll see, of irony. So uh, in this paper, I would like to address, from a, philosopher's per from a philosopher's perspective, the theme of laughter and irony in or with the, or we, uh, together with Japanese culture. So it's an intercultural attempt that begins with a difficulty, which is also part of the interest. Of because irony and laughter have a minor and yet particular, we could say particularly minor, history in the religious uh, and philosophical thought of Europe. Because Socrates might have been famous as an ironist, whatever that meant in his case, but it's hard to deny that to Plato already philosophy was a deadly serious matter and his mood did set the default for philosophical practice up to now. So philosophy is a serious business, and according to someone, irony is in the direct opposition to philosophy. So things are not particularly different within religious tradition either, at least in the West, because indeed Semitic monotheism and European Christianity spare little to no attention for laughter, especially as a spiritual phenomenon. And we can, while we can surely name some exception in, in this philosophical canon, so as we'll see, the author, authors like Vico, Schlegel, Kierkegaard, Little Bergson, Plesner, Frotti, uh, who, who wrote about irony and laughter, we'll see how relevant their contributions are, but this minority reflects something in Western thought. And my, my suggestion is some, an attitude toward the body, and language in particular, that makes extremely difficult reflecting about or with laughter. Uh, we shall say for now there is something in our own laughter that resists theory and categorization. And uh, according to Paul Demand, even saying the concept of irony is ironic. There's no, there's no way to make a concept out of it. Uh, it is not in opposition to philosophy, irony, it's in opposition to philosophy, not by being something alien to it, but as an internal contradiction, a counterforce. So if we look at irony, um, an irony in Chinese and Japanese intellectual traditions, however, then the situation is distinctly different. Because even from the outlook, even very superficially, we can think of the laughing madman praised by Tao's tradition, Duanza, uh, the spiritual foolishness of Chinese poetry, the corpus of Zen anecdotes, the laughing fat face of the Chinese Buddha. Why does, why does Buddha start laughing from India to China? Uh, or even more interesting, the, the things made of a Japanese Bodhisattva. Here we get the Bodhisattva Canon from Nara. So, as Robert Blythe very beautifully say, says, it is possible to read the Bible without a smile and the Quran without a chapel. No one has died of laughing while reading the Buddhist sutras, but Zen writings have abounded in anecdotes to stimulate the diaphragm. Something very badly. And it's indeed from a smile, if you want to follow the mythical account uh, about the first patriarch of Zen, Mahakasyapa, that the very tradition of the Zen school is born. And this is obviously a, fictu uh, a fictitious account, but later is also used and considered as a koan. So let it look at it as it's uh, exposing Mumonka. Once upon a time, when Shakyamuni Buddha was on the vulture peak, he twirled a flower in his finger and held it before his congregation. Everyone was silent, and only Mark Kashapa's face broke into a smile. Buddha said, I have the eye of the true teaching, the heart of Nirvana, the formless form, the mysterious gate of Dharma, beyond the words and beyond the teachings to be transmitted, and now passed this on to Mark Kashapa. But what's Mumonkan's comment? So this is usually taken as an account of Ishin and Shin, and how Zen is magically not relying on words. Mokan says something completely different. Golden-faced Gautama impudently forced the good people into depravity. He sold dog meat under the name of Martin, and he, to, and he thought he made it. Then Mumokan adds a poem, at the turning of a flower, the snake showed that is Buddha, the snake shows his tail, Maka Kashapa smile, and every monk does not know what to do. But what's happening in this koan? The smile of Maka Kashapa is often Consider Ishin the Shin, but the mind to mind, but Momokan is not all suggesting that laughter is the sign of such a peaceful understanding, because he's calling Buddha a liar, a snake, 
And he wonders very correctly what would have happened if everyone or none of the monks had left before Jesus. What happens when a joke fades? No one is left there. Uh, so Martha Shepherd smiles and every monk does not know what to do. Because laughter and error are indeed perplexing phenomena that arise exactly when a linear propositional mode of understanding, made of concepts, ideas, proper meanings, is put under bra uh, um, in brackets or destroyed. So it's fitting a strange, at the same time, that is ironic, that Zen is at the same time a tradition of rigorous and body training, of wordless meditation, and born from a laughter. Um, a laughter that also has this very dangerous habit of turning what is into what is not, close to a cheat or a simple lie. Gautama sells dog meat under the name of mutton, says Momoka, and he's absolutely understanding what's the problem with irony. Because, so maybe we can reach a better grasp of this dual phenomenon, laughter, irony, by rephrasing how, in this episode, there seem to be an interwine of three themes, this is my suggestion for today, um, namely, body, language, and negativity or hollowness, or as it will argue eventually, emptiness itself. That is the attempt that I would like to try today in this paper. So, I will start with laughter and the body, which is the most superficial and visible, and, and also, since we're dealing with contradiction, mind maybe it's the deepest. Back to the text of Mumonkan, we see that the decisive moment is described by a four-character expression, Hagami Shou. So, uh, literally, as we smile or laugh, our face breaks. The normal control we seem to possess or our conscious movement is suspended, and our mouth, lungs, eyes, face muscles, lacrimal ducts start organizing themselves on their own, in a different rhythmic movement. Laughter is essentially us being controlled by or existing as such a breathing, as uh, Isaac Sen said, said yesterday. The, in laughter, we don't, we don't laugh, actually. There is a laughter, and we exist as it, for a little while. It takes a time. So Helmut Plethner, the, the German philosopher and um, philosophical anthropologist, notes, however, that while laughter is not an expression of something, we can, that is, we cannot separate it from a message, from the modes of its happening, this lack of control that is not implied by any means a lessened state of our minds uh, in which we would capitulate as a person. On the contrary, by laughing, or even by the faintest mind, even by the almost completely suppressed laughter that escapes, that is, breaks, through eyes and eyebrows in a formal but awkward situation, the regional unity of body-mind, of Xinjing, is given in a heightened state. Lesson right, this organization of the relation between man and his physical existence, existence is not real, but to be sure, but also it sets in an overwhelming way, still not really accepted and endured. On the contrary, it's understood as expressive movement, a significant reaction. By the disorganization of this inner balance, Man at once forfeits in relation to his body and reestablishes it. The effective impossibility of finding a suitable expression and an appropriate answer is at the same time the only suitable expression, the only appropriate answer. That's even though Henry Plessner was not laughing that much, it's not a very funny book. But I think that well, he's right because this vertigo, that's the expression he uses, reveals how the apparently unproblematic relation that we have with our bodies is actually on an unresolvable paradox. So on one, on one hand, we exist bodily, we both space, time, a sphere of meaning and relations constantly arising from this pers first person, or often a hidden body experience, lifeless. But at the same time, we have a body. We have a som somatic body. We exert our control in it as a physical object among others who define qualities and affordances. This unity is paradoxical and unresolvable. Because Result, we always live it with the within, with it, within the potential of this primitive presence, uh, as the Trevor Hermas meets, which is unerasable. But, and Plessner is very absolutely right in that, even a dog or a cat that poses for a second before taking a jump has a sort of understanding, a non representational understanding of his own body as a somatic thing. It is hard to deny that the attempt to However, it's hard to deny that this, the attempt to resolve this paradox in most Western thought has been removing the first person body consciousness and reduce the body to the somatic element. This explains the particular difficulty or panic that is faced by Western psyche, which traditionally uh, conceived itself as disembodied, once it's forced to rediscover itself in or as the, syncop the syncopated breathing of laughter. 
And it's telling to me how the war spirit, even after thousands of years of intellectual history, have tried to erase its original sense of breath and wind, still obstinately keep a reference to irony and laughter as plutonary phenomena. Spirit, esprit, just like the sign of Japanese word fury, for instance, has a double sense of spiritual and comic. That is, it's still expressing in its polysemy this essential unity of body and transcendence, it manifests in the as it manifests in the catastrophic unity of laughter, or also in the educated discipline of mindful breathing, as we also find in forces in Zen tradition. So here we discover something which is pretty ironic by itself, that is, the most basic and revived form of humor, scatology, might be very well the most basic in a phenomenological sense too. That is, toilet humor and sexual laughter are not simply a transgression of social norms about cleanliness and proper behavior, but an anarchic reminder of how the idea of a closed body and independent mind that the reason behind such regulations about sex and proper, proper embodiment is a delusion. So there is something funny about in the body itself, in its spontaneity, openness, frequent insubordination to the control of our conscious selves. And the funniest part of the body is not its positive unity, like if you think of the somatic, the muscular, like we don't laugh before a Greek sculpture, never. Because that is taken as an aesthetic object. But what's funny in the body is its holes. Mouth and nose, mucus, spit, vomit, food and drinks, genitals, sexual intercourse, pee, assholes, farts and feces, are together with the pulmonary cavity, inhabited by laughter, the places where the body reveals its hollow character, where the strict border between external and internal, body and, mi body and mind, self and self, are crossed and erased. To quote um, Peter Schlotterdijk, the arse crosses all borders playfully, unlike the head, which borders and possession mean a lot, uh, from the um, critic of cynical reason. So the head is flung back on the body exactly because such, this is the Hegel's cell. This is a serious, it's an emaki from um, Edo period, where we can see that like, the air is crossing, the asshole is re literally crossing borders in this case. Um, because the head is flung back from the body exactly because such body has holes. Here are two similar, here I would like to present you two similar poetic examples of such laughter in which the violent logic of the body is shown in both his comic and tragic characters. Uh, the first one is a old uh, Kyoka by the Renga master Yamataki Sokan. Uh, and the beautiful translation by Gil, distressing, yes, distressing, and yet it's really a blast, for a far too escapey while your death breathes his last. The Latin Haikai Master Tetoku was horrified by it, saying its, its breach of file of piety was too much even for comic verse. And yet we can argue that while being almost blasphemous, there is something very fitting in showing together the tragedy of, the, of a death, or a father's death, and a fart. Because how and low they may be, but they both show how eventually we are our bodies, we are subject through our body and subject to our bodies, equally unable to control our last breath and our heart. And that is the tragedy and the comedy of human existence. And irony is the two of them turning into each other in the blink of an eye. Another, basically the same structure, can be seen in another haiku by Akutagawa Ryunosuke, uh, who chose it as a suicide note in 1926 with the maigaki that is a form of Jicho, I laughed at myself. Jicho, Mizubana ya, sono saki ni dake, kuro no koru. I laugh at myself. My runny nose, just on the tip lingers, the very last light. As the mental illness, Akutagawa was one of the first modernist, major modernist writers in Japan, and like he suicided himself in 1926 after like a, a series of crises of mental illness. And uh, since many years, he's taken his toll, and what's unraveling is psychological unity. And Akotagawa notices, though, how his own body is somehow still there, and the tragic hero of his self narration and self construction is just a little animal, or even not there at all, being a incoherent sum of the temporary embodied regions that, for instance, we, we can call it bo body islands with Hermann Schmidt. So, just the tip of a nose. Choosing a poem to comment his suicide, Akutagawa is also parodying a tradition of Jise, but that points within Chinese and Japanese, often monks, with a death as the, defini the, the um, ultimate moment of no self, sometimes with images that were, however, rather serious or even self aggrandizing. 
So here, iron here is turned to the body, to the self, with destructive results. But irony and language, since I started, I started using poems, uh, because the body, or rather the paradoxical unity and separation of body-mind, is the first element we need to understand the moment and co on and laughter at all. But no matter how important the laughable quality of the body and visual elements, caricature, mimicry, pantomime, or even tipo can be, we must also understand irony and laughter in their relationship with language, their existing within and as it. Of course, this relationship, just as the one with the body, is a paradoxical one. And once again, Momokan is absolutely on spot, I think, because laughter, in a certain sense, is the opposite of language. Everybody's silent, somebody's smiling or laughing, and that's so the very far opposite. But at the same time, language itself, in its condition of possibility, is marked by irony to its very core. If you look at definitions of irony in Europe, we will see that, in fact, after being born as a philosophical stance or tool embodied by Socrates, is irony becomes an essentially rhetoric term. Irony, to quintillion, is saying what is contrary to what is meant. And well, later on, the comic plays of Aristophanes, ar ironia, refer to lying rather than complex dissimulation. Gian Battista Vico, an Italian thinker with an extreme attention to language and the relationship between language and thought, uh, according to Jürgen Trab, an anticipator of the linguistic turn of 19th and 20th century, thinks that tropes themselves constitute an ecology of the human mind through the um, progression of historical development. And irony is the last one. Irony is the trope of modernity, says Vico in the New Science, because irony certainly could have not begun until the period of reflection, because it is a fashion of falsehood by dint of a reflection which wears the mask of truth. So, according to Vico, basically, primitive people couldn't have lied, because they were talking with a figurative, poetic language where everything is basically present. And so, rather than being straightforwardly connected to laughter, irony resides in a gap between language and reality that makes both self-conscious critical reflection, philosophy, in, in short, and outline lying possible. Here is why I was really impressed by such precision that Mumon Kanto Cohen tells of a golden face Gautama having sold, go uh, sold dog meat under the name of Martin. Buddha's acceptance of the relative, arbitrary, and intersubjective quality of language is the extreme opposite of Christ, I am the truth, I am the way. But also means that there is no absolute and clear differentiation between Buddha's evil mean and an utter lie. As soon as man gains self-reflectivity, Vico realizes, the adherence of language and experience, let alone reality, is never guaranteed. This is the paradox also um, expressed by Plastin through the expression of eccentric position of human being our contemporary being and having a body, but this eccentric position seems also to have an, an isomorphic, to exist as an uh, isomorphic paradox within language itself. That is, words and concepts are at the same time the mode of our consciousness, the house of being, and empty, bendable, arbitrary phrases in a system of difference where nothing is positively given. A positive language of full meaning is impossible not because of our intellectual limitations, but because the iteration following the Derrida, negativity and exteriorization are essential parts of language. Laughter is therefore the opposite of language, just as irony is the opposite side of philosophy. But we should not intend it in the sense of a mystic silence or a call to the ineffable. Laughter is the opposite of language because it marks its internal impossibility, the hollowness behind its apparent fullness. And just as the relation between the laughter and body was revealed at, uh, at its best in scatology, toilet humor, Another extremely despised form of humor, the language based, basically, the language based equivalent of toilet humor, and usually also being in conjunction with it, is the clearest case of this linguistic connection between emptiness and laughter. I'm talking about wordplay, double entendre, puns. So, because the outer arbitrary form of language is transparent insofar we're dealing with concepts. Basically, any form of idealism of Platonism prefers this relationship between the idea and ideas and linguistic form, the same hierarchy relationship within the soul and the body. But puns, when we are making wordplays or puns, dajare, uh, uh, we suddenly shift this the, the exterior form into the foreground, recognizing how even the most transparent and good transmission of ideas and thought is undetachable from a net of contingent linguistic forms. This has been actually the, the, one of the, 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 great, the greatest tools of Jacques Derrida's philosophy. So, punning for him is, is not at all a cause. 
is acknowledgement. There's, however, another a philosophical defense of puns is an explicit preoccupation for another, for a Japanese thinker with a great attention for the phenomenon of contingency, kukishuzo. Puns and rhymes are for Kuki a manifestation of contingency within language and ultimately a reminder of the irreducible contingency of, extent, of existence itself. Quoting from the, his collection of Tuhitze, the internal life of a person that listening to a pun ignores it or raises an eyebrow is incredibly empty. The faintest smile can throw a happy light on our serious depressing day of existence. One day in Paris, so here we are, Michael Phelps turned towards me and said, Le Japonais, they don't need any cavalry, do they? And I asked him why, he answered, But you saw the Japonais, they are ready ponies. Strangely, this joke that was making horses out of human beings eased my nostalgia for my homeland. Nostalgia is something that falls upon us in the journey of our existence, too. Even a light joke is not bad from time to time. Paul Valéry once compared the homophony of two words to the smile exchanged by two twins. That's a terrible joke. We agree. But it is a cookie's nostalgia. Why? Due to a homophony, a man, who is obviously a man, becomes a pony. The law of identity, according to which, according to which things are themselves and themselves only, is broken. A man, while obviously being still a man, is also a pony who is not. The meeting of being and not being, who and Moo, which has been forcefully ignored or despised by most of the story of Western thought, is what Cookie tried to focus on his, the problem of contingency from 1936. The contingent structure of the human existence, too, is such a meeting of being and nothingness. Cookie's nostalgia and loneliness are very concrete examples of this ambivalence. A nostalgic man is at the same time here and not here, living, as a, living painfully the contradiction between his position in space and the equally contingent determination of his birthplace. This is what a ridicule image of Japanese as a ready pony can, can ease such nostalgia. Showing to Kuki, reminding to Kuki that any kind of identity of being is open to transfiguration to something completely different, given its internal relationship with difference and non being. So, even upon, it's not at all distant from the apparently higher, noble, romantic irony, where the mind of an artist, but according to Solgen and Schlegel, the mind of an artist must combine all directions into one synoptic view. We call this view bleak, soaring above everything and destroying everything, irony. In turn, Schlegel defines irony as continually fluctuating between self-creation self and self-destruction. So irony here is not anymore a rhetorical figure, but a style of existence. And Schlegel calls irony a divine breath. And we see here irony again fluctuating, soaring, breathing, its basic element is really the aerial, something that partly has to do with the same real ontology of air, and partly reflects again the fundamental connection of laughter, air, and respiration. Just as we do with our breathing, through the ironic blick, we are constantly going back and forth, outside and inside, being and not being, self and other. Because another of Schlegel's discovery was a dialectic unit of contradiction as a condition for both intersubjectivity, both art and thought. So, lastly, Philosophy is the real homeland of irony, not just the opposite of it, which one would like to define as logical beauty. For whenever philosophy appears in oral, written dialogues, and is not simply confined to the religious system, their irony should be asked for and provided. Because the last condition of irony is our togetherness. Even if I laugh alone or hurt myself, I always include potential others in my laughter, in a way completely different from sadness or joy. Um, laughter, arises at the paradoxical unity of I and thou. And again, we can see the structure of laughter in another famous poem of the tradition from the Blue, Blue Creek Records. Kyozan Ejaku asked Sancho Enel, what's your name? Sancho said, Ejaku. Ejaku, replied Kyozan, that's my name. Well then, said Sancho, my name is Enel. And Kyozan roared with laughter. Nishitani Keiji, uh, here, uh, here I end, Nishitani Kijini says the I and Thou relationship in Zen Buddhist thinks that this laughter is indeed the place of a fundamental meeting, where the two men lose their individuality, again, it was the effect of laughter, according to Plesner, without simply vanishing, again, following Plesner. Uh, to quote Nishitani, in this place of laughter, the reality of the encounter between one man and another may be transformed, as it is, into a super reality. Such super-reality corresponds to a non-substantial relationality that Nishitani himself, following Mahayana and Zen tradition in particular, calls emptiness, shunyata. My conclusion is in fact exactly this one. 
and we can understand both laughter and irony as forms of embodied, interpersonal, and linguistic but non-propositional comprehension of the, of the fundamental interpretation of phenomena that the Mahayana Buddhist tradition has called emptiness. This is why irony seems to be everywhere and why it escapes a positive definition or conceptualization. This is why we should be not afraid of ironic philosophy, not in the reduced sense of postmodernism, and acknowledge how ironic discourse is a fundamental element of East Asian and Japanese intellectual practices, one we should try to appreciate deeply if we really are attempting any intercultural approach. Thank you so much. That's uh, and actually, and actually, I I had to cut the last part, which of course Bly says something very nice. Uh, uh, a theory of iron is not interesting because it pops up from real life. So life for life for Zen mountains, then eventually I have to go down there. And probably the three most interesting ironic figures are in Japanese culture: are Dogen, Iq, and Basho. So I'm trying to work on that, and I would like to expand a little bit more on Basho in the thesis, but. It's important to go back to, to, to actual moments of laughter, like the Lapo and Any questions, comments? Do you consider also including Bergson in your research? That's a of course, he's one of the he's one of the first named names to pop up. Also, he's uh, been well read in Japan, in Japan yeah. too. Uh, the thing with Purple Song, his his theory of laughter is very vitalistic. So uh, actually, Plasma is rereading Berson like with this scheme because, for instance, uh, Berson laughter is never is never really uh, it's not it's never really linguistic. It's not taking account of this all sort of irony on like the, the sort of tragic irony too. But to um, to Plasta, like, the embodied like when he said that mechanical, actually Plasta is saying uh, yes. In that in that case, we are laughing because there's a we feel a gap between form and function of the body. And I think it's a, again Plasta is very technical and it's a it's a strange book about laughter and absolutely serious and hard to read. But I think he's taking account of Bergson and giving a very deep reading which makes more sense than actually Bergson does alone. Because otherwise it's, a, it's not explaining everything. It's a very specific, specific perspective, which also, however, seems to be uh, always the case. There's no way to give a positive and complete account of phenomena as laughter and irony. Yeah. And maybe because they're, really because they're a manifestation of the whole world. So they're always relational and uh, contextual. There's, there's no one way to give one rule and then cover every, every possible case. I also have a question. Um, uh, when I think of irony, I think of a similar phenomena like um, uh, to be cynic or to be um, sarcastic. And interestingly, uh, to be cynical, cynicism comes from philosophy, from the cynics, like nobody's a cynic. So it's kind of also connected to a philosophical tradition. So do you make any Irony, sarcasm, cynicism, or how but cynicism, this, the, this quote from Schlotterdijk is coming from his critique uh, of cynical reason, mm -hmm. which is also a very funny book, mm -hmm. and he's taking here an account of physiognomy of the cynic. Uh, cynicism is a, yeah, it's a, well, I mean, well, his research is huge and very interesting. He's divided between two layers, uh, like the, talking about the cynic and the cynic. But the, the point, if we think of uh, Diogenes saying to Alexander, get up, I, I can, Alexander says, I can give you anything, I say, I will uh, answer to your wish, to any of your wishes, and say, get out of my son. So that's, uh, it's aggressive, 
that's, that's, that's a highly dangerous potential in laughing because it's a form of negation. That's, it. So, uh, that's the case with Akutagawa in the, in the sense of it's a jicho, but of course it's a violent activity. And when Mumon can say, well, he, he's, a, he's lying. That, that, that's also, which is also, when we are laughing at someone, especially we, we can think, I mean, jokes can be horrible things because they're strip men of their humanity. Like if we are laughing at uh, well, racist jokes, sexist jokes, they are part of a structure of power and the strict people of humanity. So it's, it's not at all always a good thing. Um, a cynicism is uh, realizing. Like it's, a, well, it's a Hellenistic philosophy and all of them sort of deal with negativity. Um, and uh, I think so, so the Sarkand is except it partakes of the same structure of laughter as in, entailing some negation, but he's doing that in an aggressive way. Sometimes it's, also, it's very important, uh, you can think of satire, which is also in Japanese fushi, it's again something about wind, something is blowing away, it can be violent. Uh, with Kaze and Sasu actually, so it's a piercing wind, a satire. Uh, where you're, you're destroying something without touching, without, without really engaging it, like you're blowing it away. But then, of course, I mean, it's, uh, this is why, for instance, the, 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 the typical uh, disability understanding of the Shin the Shin with the, uh, of that is way more superficial than the Momonkan, which is acknowledging how dangerous it is, actually.